Hi, dance friends. This past week, dancer and photographer Quinn Wharton said the following about his just divinely ridiculous quarantine video project. I had to birth this in solitude and silence to take it seriously. So do you know what the project is? Have you heard about this yet? In case you haven't, we'll reveal the answer at the end of this episode of the Dance Edit podcast. everyone, and welcome to the Dance Edit Podcast. I'm Margaret Fuhrer. I'm Courtney Escoin. And I'm Cadence Dinan. We are editors at Dance Magazine and Dance Spirit Magazine, and in today's episode, we'll be touching on some of the week's dance headlines, as always, um, discussing some Broadway news that's actually uplifting for a change, thinking about what the new normal might look like as dancers begin to head back to the studio, and hearing a husband and wife team social dis- dancing with a D voice memo. Um, from ABT principal and Cat Spawn artistic director Stella Abrera and ABT studio company director Sasha Radetzky. I can't wait for that. Um, First, though, just a reminder that this podcast is actually a companion to our daily email newsletter, which you should sign up for at thedanceedit.com. And you should also give us a follow on Twitter at dance underscore edit, because we've sort of been getting a bit more chatty and a bit less newsy on the podcast, which I think is kind of a natural (laughs) progression. Um, But you can still get your up to the minute dance news via the daily newsletter and our Twitter feed in case that's your thing. Um, now on to our first segment, which is our quick sauté through the week's dance headlines. A lot of these news items are sort of the other shoe dropping types of stories about what's happening to companies now that they've been forced to cancel everything, what the, the fallout of that is. But we're at least starting with a heartwarming one. Cadence, will you kick us off? So our first story is about the beloved Los Angeles ballet teacher, Joan Bailey. What did she get for her 100th birthday? A drive-by birthday party, of course, complete with roughly 50 cars full of former students and well-wishers and lots and lots of balloons. Which is just lovely to hear. Yeah, happy belated birthday, Joan. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, sorry, taking us on a downturn here. Uh, so Cirque du Soleil, as previously reported, uh, is an exceptionally strained financial situation. Uh, 44 shows shuttered, nearly 5,000 employees laid off, near total loss of revenue. But the founder who sold his stake in the company back in February has indicated that he's spoken to backers about buying back in to help resuscitate it. Um, Australia's Queensland Ballet officially announced that its 2020 performance season will be postponed to 2021, as leadership in the company believes that it's not financially feasible to resume performances any sooner. So slightly less stringent measures taken at Texas Ballet Theater. Um, They've pushed the start of the season to November with The Nutcracker. The original opener has been rescheduled for May. And while they aren't anticipating any layoffs, uh, they have reduced full-time employee salaries, cut dancer contracts down by about two weeks, eliminated live music for performances, um, all in order to reduce the season budget by $2 million. Um, Another story about a ballet company budget problem, the UK's Northern Ballet, which had just begun to celebrate its 50th anniversary before the pandemic hit, says it has lost one million pounds due to pandemic cancellations. Yeah, well, in the UK, you know, speaking of, uh, in an op-ed for The Telegraph, a West End theater producer said that 70% of British arts organizations would shutter by the end of the year without government aid. I can go on a whole other rant about, like, the uh, decrease in government funding to UK dance organizations and arts organizations in general, and but that is a whole other can of worms. I mean, it's it's bleak, and we're only going to be seeing more stories like this going forward. I mean, especially about US companies that don't have lots of government funding built into their budgets to begin with. Um, so please, 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 guys, go right now to the Dance USA site, fill out the form they have asking Congress to include dance in future federal relief packages. They started that that campaign right at the beginning of the pandemic. It's ongoing. It is as important now as it has ever been. Please go take a look. Um, Okay, so in our next segment, we'd like to discuss two stories looking to the future of Broadway. Um, And one of them is cautiously hopeful. The other is just straight up dance nerd wish fulfillment, which we (laughs) desperately need right now. Um, So first, Broadway League president Charlotte St. Martin told the Daily Beast that she's hoping that Broadway might reopen in January 2021. 
Um, yeah, so uh, I guess that Charlotte St. Martin, you know, is looking towards 2021 as kind of, you know, let 2020 fall by the wayside in terms of live performance, which I think is the mindset a lot of producers have kind of adapted. Um, and she said in the past that most theaters and shows don't have the financial capability to operate at half capacity for social distancing. But she's hoping that by January 1st, 2021, they'll be able to operate at full capacity with theater goers wearing masks. Other Broadway leadership tends to say that they're looking at a spring 2021 opening. Yeah, and I think just reiterating, they've all been very clear, they're following the science. Um, There's no point in reopening if they're going to be putting people at risk. And also, there's no point in reopening if the public doesn't feel safe. Right. So we might not know exactly when Broadway will reopen or what that reopening might look like. But in the meantime, an announcement made this past week has us dreaming lots of sweet musical theater dreams. Um, Smash, the beloved... NBC show about the making of a musical, or rather about the making of two musicals. Let's mm-hmm. not forget about Hit List. Uh, um, Hit List. It is heading to Broadway as a musical, super meta. Um, Steven Spielberg is producing, and Josh Burgos, who also choreographed the TV version, will choreograph. Fun fact, met his now wife, Sarah Mearns, on the TV version. Yeah, she uh, auditioned for a scene that ultimately got cut, right? Right. And I mean, what's fun about this, right? It's not the first time we've heard that Smash might get the IRL Broadway treatment. Uh, Back in 2015, they did this one night only benefit concert um, that was actually streamed for the first time last week. It's fantastic. Everyone should check it out. Um, And it was, they performed Bombshell, or at least pieces of Bombshell, the the Marilyn Monroe musical that they were supposedly making within the show. Exactly. And after that, back in 2015, there was this announcement that Bombshell, that fictitious Marilyn Monroe bio-musical from the show, which they basically had the entirety of on the show, uh, that it would be heading to Broadway uh, with a very similar creative team to what's been announced here. But that project kind of quietly fizzled out. Um, whereas this project sounds a bit more like it's going to be the television series itself, um, f- focusing on our rival leading ladies, played so brilliantly by Kaffer McPhee and Megan Hilty in the show, and then a longtime composer-lyricist duo and all the heaps of interpersonal drama therein. Let's Can we start dreamcasting this thing? Because there are so many great people on the show. Here's the thing, though. I, I need Leslie Odom Jr. to be in this. <laughs> In some capacity. Mm -hmm. I will never be over him pre-Hamilton playing Sam, the chorus dancer, and just... uh. It's so good. I mean, speaking of Smash people who went on to Hamilton, Brian Darcy James, the original King George, Mm -hmm. also a Smash star. Let's just get all of them in there. Let's do it. And Jeremy Jeremy Jordan, Jordan. are you listening? Oh, I miss all of these people so much. Yeah. (laughs) One one more note on this, though. Uh, Just looking at the creative team, there aren't any women on it announced yet. They haven't yet announced a director. So please, 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 please get a woman to direct this musical when it happens. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Seconded. Thirded. Um, okay. So coming back down to earth, now back to our current reality in our next segment. So a few recent stories have given us a glimpse of what normal might look like for dancers as they slowly return to the studio. Um, Dutch national ballet dancers have started taking class at their facility again. And Dance Europe ran an interview with artistic director Ted Branson that it really gets into the specifics of how logistically they're doing that in a responsible way. It's a fascinating article and i would recommend if you have a chance to go check it out online do there's photographs that like really uh bring home how kind of strange and unusual the setup is um so basically all the dancers have a very specific route to get to the theater once they get there they have a very specific route through the building they have designated places to put their bags in the studios themselves They basically designated 32 square meters per dancer, give or take. So that's a max of six dancers at a time in the bigger studios. There's basically four studios taking the same class at the same time. And then they do that four times in between, like, disinfecting everything. It's so intensive and it's so time consuming, but it is a safe way to get them actually in the building dancing. I think the image that really struck me was seeing the piano and pianist behind a huge plastic screen. Just the reality of that, I don't know, for some reason just really was like, wow, this is reality now. I I think it's interesting that they, Branson says they got advice from the Netherlands Olympic Committee and the National Sports Federation as to how to do this safely. It's like, well, if it works, if it's good for Olympic athletes, that's what these dancers are. That makes sense. Well, and I think... 
I also love that he was like, well, they were allowed to go back to training on this date. Right. So us too. Our turn too. Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting model for other companies to potentially follow, but we do. We should note that Dutch National Ballet has a lot of resources and a lot of space. So what if you're a company that doesn't? How does this? How is this realistically going to look for you? Um, okay, so that's sort of the, the in-studio reality. And last week we talked a bit about what socially distanced dance performances might look like. It was all very abstract. We were talking about like a hazy future. But two recent stories highlighted companies who are actually exploring social distancing dance shows right now. And both of their models involve a lot of driving. Yeah, so drive-in and drive-by dance performances seem to be a new trend in the era of social distancing. In Seattle, um, a local company, Landforms, created Cooped Up Drive-In Dances for Cooped Up People, in which audience members would drive to the homes of dancers to see them perform on their porches, in their yards. It sounds like a scavenger hunt, which I'm really into. I was thinking it sounds like the social distancing version of like sleep no more. It has that immersive <laughs> theater aspect to it. I, so it's it's fascinating. Yeah. And then another take on kind of a similar idea was um, Parked, an invitation-only drive-in dance performance created by Jacob Jonas, the company, in which about 30 cars um, created a circle in a parking lot put on their lights, and that was the creation of the stage for the show. And dancers performed um, at a safe distance. They were all wearing masks, and they performed within that circle of cars for a one-night-only performance. And it ended up raising, I think, $4,000, which is really amazing. Yeah, Jacob said, like, it was great to be able to be able to pay my dancers in this time. Mm -hmm. Um, And also, he's been really open about, like, hey, if you're interested in putting on something like this, we did a lot of research into safety precautions and, like, came up with this methodology. He's willing to share it with anyone who reaches out um, and wants to bring dance to their communities, which mad props. And he's sort of, he's uniquely qualified in a way, well, not uniquely qualified, but he's well qualified to put on this kind of performance, given that he was actually a street performer back in the day on Venice Beach, on the Santa Monica Promenade. He knows about creating dance for these outdoor spaces. Um, it, they weren't, however, able to get official permission to use the space that they use. So I think he said they took the Banksy approach. They just kind of said, all right, cross our fingers. But here's hoping local governments will get on board with this kind of thing going forward. Um So next up, we have the next installment in our social disc dancing series in which we ask artists from different parts of the dance world to leave us voice memos just talking about how they're dealing with life right now. Um, This week, we have a two for one message we have from a a pair of extraordinary artists who happen to be married to each other. Um, We have iconic ballerina Stella Abrera, who is supposed to give her farewell for performance with American Ballet Theater this Met season. Um, and she also became artistic director of Kotzban, the cultural park for dance in New York at the beginning of this year. She's been curating innovative digital content for them. So we'll hear about all that. And then we have Sasha Radetzky, former ABT soloist, now and forever, Charlie from Center Stage, but <laughs> these days, director of the ABT Studio Company, where he's been doing really wonderful work with some very talented young ballet stars to be. Um, They're basically the role models to end all role models. So here they are. Hi there, Dance Edit listeners. This is Stella Abrera. And Sasha Rodetsky. And we are greeting you all from upstate New York, where Sasha and I have been sheltering in place since March 14th. So picture it. I'm in St. Petersburg, Russia. It's the middle of the night. I had just completed two weeks of work at the Marinsky, where I had the immense honor of setting seven sonatas, a Rettmansky ballet, on the gorgeous Marinsky company. Um, I noticed my phone is ringing. It wakes me up in the middle of the night, 4 a.m., and I realized there were like 10 missed calls from Sasha. Because so that afternoon, I got a tip from one of my dancers, uh, ABT Studio Company dancers, whose father works with the airline industry. And she messaged me and she said, "Look, I know that Stella is in Russia, and Trump is going to lock down flights 
coming in. He's going to ban flights coming in from Europe tonight. So I freaked out and I thought, okay, we got to get Stella home before she gets stuck over there. And so it was very Mission Impossible like. Sasha was awesome. Got me another plane ticket home. I had six hours later. Six hours later. Anyway, so long story short, I'm able to get back home to New York City. Very romantic, and my knight in shiny armor. <laughs> Very selfish. Slash, I wanted her slash back. Slash travel agent <laughs> got me back home. When did the pandemic first start to really hit home? I think it was then when all those travel bans started coming down, and we realized that we were just going life to have to start and, yeah, life sheltering and work in place. As we knew and, it and, yeah. was going to end abruptly. Mm-hmm. And our tours started uh, being canceled. The, the domino effect um, began shortly thereafter. But we rallied, we regrouped. As dancers and, do, yeah. everyone just got creative and resourceful. Yeah, and pretty quickly the company mobilized to start offering classes through Zoom as well. Uh, Cynthia, Harvey, and I started offering classes to the upper level, well, all of JKO and studio company um, with our with our staff. So I have to say it's been it's been quite moving to see these dancers in their living rooms or in their bedrooms or in their kitchens or on a little patio somewhere, continuing to work hard and pursue their dreams and just make it work. I mean, they're just, they're undaunted and they keep plugging away and they're not going to let these circumstances keep them from doing what they love to do. And, and we talk about how, you know, how, how do we reconcile sort of the disparity of risk between frontline workers and those of us who are at home safe. And we've just settled on continuing to try to create art and uh, not take these moments of safety for granted, not be, not be idle but to be grateful for each moment and to, to use each moment to better ourselves as artists and humans and try to help help one another. Wow, I really digressed. Yeah, but you hit home and it's all really important to keep that in mind. Um, I, I have one more mm-hmm. thing to add and I'm sorry to, uh, to veer toward the graver end of the spectrum, but it really started, the pandemic really started to hit home when we started losing people we knew. Absolutely. One of the JKO teacher's husband passed away. He was an emergency room doctor. And her uh, her spirit has certainly been inspiring to all of us. Uh, also, we, we lost a beloved, Willie Berman, te- a beloved teacher. Yeah, and, yes. then, and, and then uh, Noni, one of your friends. So you know, that's the kind of starkest realization that this is, this stuff is real. Yes, I am heartbroken that my farewell performance was canceled at the Metropolitan Opera House. I was really looking forward to saying goodbye to that beloved theater um, and to f- many cherished roles in this season. Um, My heart also does go out to many of my friends and coworkers who were slated to have big debuts this season. It was going to be a big season for so many. I will say that I am incredibly grateful to look back on my career at ABT and to know that I have 24 years of memories of being on so many of the world's stages of dancing so many incredible works of art with fantastic dancers. So that is what I will celebrate. So as well as retiring from ABT, I'm transitioning into the position of artistic director at Kotzbahn Cultural Park for Dance. It's right on the Hudson River with enormous cathedral-like dance studios and just 
a wonderful opportunity for dance residencies. Although we were disappointed that Mark Morris, ABT Studio Company, Martha Nichols, and Alejandro Ceruto, among many others, couldn't come on site to perform or have their residencies, we were able to have a digital dance residency, which is a a way for us to share the work of these wonderful groups and artists with a broader reach that uh, social media can help us attain. So not only did we pivot from our on-site performances and residencies, but we also revamped our on-site ballet intensive program. So now that will be offered online. It invigorates me as a teacher and as a dancer and as a dance lover to see the next generation be so hardcore and (laughs) so inspiring at such a young age. So that's been the silver lining for me. I think it's going to just feel incredible to get back in a studio and do a Gran Allegro sequence across the floor or go on stage and do a menage and have that space and freedom just to be among kindred spirits doing what you love to do, I think is, uh, it's going to be really powerful and meaningful. And as a viewer to be in an audience, I mean, we're going to have new appreciation for those community uh, endeavors. I don't think anyone's ever going to complain about an uncomfortable seat in the audience or a slippery floor or bright lights ever again. We're just going to be so grateful to be doing what we love to do. For what it's worth, I'll read you something I wrote to my studio company dancers when we all scattered into quarantine. Mind, this is where we can now make real progress as artists, intellectuals, seekers of experience and wisdom. Now we have the time to read everything. Now we can listen to and appreciate all the music. Please research ABT, its repertoire, choreographers, dancers, designers, leaders. Research other dance companies, ballet and otherwise. Watch all the good ballet videos on YouTube. Watch the Oscar-winning movies from the last few decades. Volunteer virtually. Pin someone special a poem. Sketch a portrait of your grumpy family cat or the pigeon on your windowsill. Move, create, dream. Take a beginner tap class on YouTube. Look up Einstein's theories of relativity and Hawking's findings on black holes and let your mind blow apart. Then gaze up into the night sky as if for the first time. Take a crack at playing an instrument if you can access one. Memorize a poem or monologue. Decide which ballets, books, or paintings move you and consider why. Discover what it is about your favorite dancer, beyond the obvious, that's so mesmerizing. Build your artistic palette. Expand your range of reference. Get worked up about something of meaning and beauty. Stoke your curiosity for art and life. From our home to yours, sending love to all in the dance world. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Stella. Thanks, Sasha. We love you. Thank you, guys. First of all, Stella, we hope you get your proper farewell, whatever form that ends up taking. Um, And we're rooting for Sasha and his studio company dancers, too. So be sure to follow Stella on Instagram at Stella Abrera Radetzky. And also follow the official Kotspan account at K-A-A-T-S-B-A-A-N um, to keep up with her. Sasha doesn't do Instagram, but make sure to follow <laughs> at ABT Studio Co. to see what he and all those talented kids are up to. Um, so finally, before we sign off, here is the answer to our pop quiz from the top of the episode. This past week, dancer and photographer Quinn Wharton said the following about his just delightfully silly quarantine video project. I had to birth this in solitude and silence to take it seriously. And I love that I positioned this quote as if not having read the accompanying article, you would have any (laughs) idea what the project is. (laughs) Like, you will literally never guess it. Um, So what video did Quinn birth in solitude and silence? It's a, okay. It's a remake of that like famous final dance scene from Dirty Dancing, uh, in which Quinn is the Patrick Swayze role, and the Jennifer Grey role is a lamp. I I feel like this video was a visual representation of my quarantine brain inner monologue, in which I have taken to calling inanimate objects baby. <laughs> um, and I'm doing great, and clearly so is Quinn. Oh, many points for that, Cadence. 
Some people play Animal Crossing, some people bake sourdough bread, and I guess if you're Quinn Wharton, you recreate famous dance film scenes alone in your apartment. And it's wonderful. And note that we're saying scenes, plural. This is supposed to be a series. I think the next one he's going to do is the see the dance sequence from The Breakfast Club, in which oh, I, yes. I'm trying to figure out if he's going to play all the different characters himself or if each one of them will be a different inanimate object. And I'm also trying to figure out which I would prefer. <laughs> I want both. Can we have both? Do you hear us, Quinn? That's our, that's our request. <laughs> um, all right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. We will be back next week for more discussion of all the news moving the dance world. And please don't forget to sign up for the Daily Dance Edit email newsletter at thedanceedit.com. Keep dancing, everyone. Bye. Bye. The Dance Edit Podcast is a product of Dance Media, publisher of Dance Magazine, Dance Spirit, Point, Dance Teacher, Dance Business Weekly, and the Dance Edit Newsletter. Our hosts are Courtney Escoyne, Margaret Fuhrer, Lydia Murray, and Cadence Neenan. Our music is by Celestine, with special thanks to Broadway Dance Center for helping us record those footfall sounds. Find out more about the Dance Edit and subscribe to our daily newsletter at thedanceedit.com. Thank you.